Well, welcome to our inaugural speaker series for the fall semester. For those of you who I don't know, I'm Ray Kaminsky, president here at Jefferson College, and it's my privilege to uh, welcome you here today. We've got a great crowd, and I think a really interesting topic. And uh, it has some relevancy, as I'm sure you will see. Uh, our topic today is, um, you know, the, the changing forms of um, polite or political behavior. Polite behavior. Now, it's not political, so don't, don't go there. And there's no current person mentioned in this presentation. So, so whatever conclusions you draw, they're yours alone, and we're not going there, okay? Uh, well, I'm, you know, trying to, I'm, I'm leading you down a bad path there, Barry. I'm sorry. Well, our, our speaker today is Jamie Barasa. Uh, she is an associate archivist for the Missouri Historical Society. She's been there about 10 years. She works on digitization and description projects and also provides public service in the reading room several days a week. Uh, she received a BA in English Literature from Michigan State University and an MSI in Information with specialization in archives and records management from the University of Michigan. I'm gonna have to show her our library, there's no doubt about that. A Michigan native, which we've been talking about, she enjoys traveling, reading, writing, and playing keyboard. So please, if you will, help me join Jamie Barossa. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, manners and etiquette and how they've changed throughout the years, especially since the 19th century onto today. And uh, first I want to thank my colleague Emily Jacox, who is the one who initially put together this presentation. So Emily gets all the credit for the research and content and the slides. Uh, so we have a lot to get through, so let's get started. Uh, so etiquette has always been changing throughout the years, and I think most people have an impression today that people are getting less polite. Um, as we go through the, the ages. And here's a quote from an etiquette guide uh, that says, the custom of shaking hands is gradually disappearing from society. Can anybody guess what year this might have come from? Uh, so believe it or not, this is actually 1883. So well over 130 years ago, people were already worried about people becoming less polite. Uh, one way etiquette guides are very interesting is you can kind of get a glimpse for how people behaved at any particular um, point in history. Uh, this one has advice for uh, men and women shaking hands. It says a lady is not expected to shake hands with a gentleman upon introduction, and a gentleman has no right to extend his hand first to a lady. So what this tells us about the 1880s at least is that um, the rules were more strict for how men could behave towards women than how women could behave towards men. Uh, the men kind of had to wait for an introduction to the lady or some kind of um, sign that she was interested in uh, being acquainted with him. Um, also, it says a lady is not expected to shake hands with the caller when he leaves, uh, also telling us that the rules were more loose for how women could behave. And of course, good friends shake hands without regard to rules. Uh, so familiar groups like family and uh, close friends, they develop their own rules that may or may not conform to the larger society. So one of the questions uh, I'm going to try to answer is who gets to decide what good manners are? Now, who decides the rules? <laughs> yes, you're right. Uh, etiquette guides are a main place that these rules come from and that people consult for how they should behave in different situations. Uh, probably as long as publishing has been around, there have been people who've been only too happy to tell other people what good bad man manners are. Um, and you know that if something is specifically forbidden in an etiquette guide, that means people did behave that way sometimes. It's other, so otherwise, there'd be no need to tell people not to do it. Uh, so how do we know how people behaved in the past? Um, etiquette books, of course, um, especially consulting the do's and don'ts guides, uh, the sections. But you can also get that information in other ways, including diaries. Uh, where people would write about incidents that stood out in their minds because of a breach of etiquette. Uh, I transcribed a diary once where a man in a boarding house in 1850s New York wrote about this woman he lived with who would sniff every mouthful uh, of food before eating it, and he just thought this was the rudest, uh, grossest thing ever. Uh, so from that, you can infer that people did not normally do that in the 1850s. 
nor do they do them today. <laughs> Another place you can consult is novels, uh, especially novels that were written in the time period you're interested in. So if you're looking uh, to research Victorian London, for example, um, you can consult the novels of Charles Dickens and Anthony Trollope. Uh, today you can also look at some uh, period dramas in movies and television. Uh, some of them take great care with historical accuracy and have teams of people re dedicated to researching the time period. Additionally, you can consult photographs. Uh, these can tell you a lot about how people dressed, uh, how tables were set, how houses were decorated, etc. And also memory, uh, our memories and the memories of people around us, uh, memoirs that people have written about how uh, they remember things changing from the time they were young to how they were today. Uh, so manners were an important topic at the founding of our country. The United States was founded on the basis of equality under the law, um, which was very different than Europe, which had nobility and peasants, and not a whole lot in between. Um, but the United States had a, had a different way of doing things. And it still wasn't true equality like we understand it today. It really still meant uh, wealthier white property holders. Um, but it was still very different from what Europe had. Um, people in, in high offices were elected based on merit, not necessarily born to rule. And uh, because of this new system of government, uh, we had new questions, uh, such as a basic question, which was, what do we call the president? Some people favored sir, others thought Mr. President, but then there were other people who thought this didn't even go far enough, such as John Adams, who at the time of this discussion was an ambassador to, ambassador to England, and uh, he was a fan of their courtly, kind of over-the-top ways of addressing people. So his idea for what the president should be called was His Highness, the President of the United States and the Protector of their Liberties. Which is quite a mouthful. Just imagine saying that every time you address the president. Uh, and this, he was not president at the time, so this wasn't self-serving. But still, most people, fortunately, did not agree with him. And what we ended up with was Mr. President, which is what we still say today. Uh, it's respectful, um, but it's not overly fawning, and it, it works out pretty well. So in the United States, um, even though we have this idea of equality for all, there's still been tension between um, this idea of equality and elitism. Here, for an example, is a humble, humble frontiersman who, under the law, is as free and equal as anybody else. However, there have always been people who uh, wish to set themselves apart from other people. And one way they've historically been able to do this is through fine manners. Uh, this is um, an image from a guidebook intended for self-made men that was published in the 1880s. And um, it had advice on things such as writing business letters and performing introductions. And it's interesting because you can see the division of the classes in this image. Kind of difficult to see, but it looks like the people in the balcony, uh, they're dressed more plainly than the people on the floor, who have fancy details in their hats and clothing. And also kind of interesting in this image is that you see several women on the stage, even though this was 40 some years before uh, women were allowed to vote. Uh, here is also a story that, from a magazine that illustrates uh, the division between the classes. It tells the story of a young woman in the country um, who is loved by everybody who knows her. She has a heart of gold. And uh, here she's shown making a pie at home. And somebody gets the idea to send her to the city to uh, learn fine manners. And they think if anybody deserves it, she does. So they put together some money, and off she goes. And uh, now she she's more finely dressed. She has learned how to play the piano and sing. And a few years later, she comes back to her old neighborhood to visit her old friends. And she's kind of affronted by um, their manners because they don't have the airs and graces that she learned at school. So she ends up snubbing them. And the question asks if she actually used her fine manners to become more polite or more rude. So it's, it's kind of human nature for people to want to elevate themselves above their uh, current position. And there's always been plenty of people who are willing to sell people something to help them do that. Uh, just think about designer brands today, uh, clothing and cars. They may or may not necessarily be any better than more generic things, but people are willing to pay hundreds or thousands of dollars to um, get that elite item. 
As an illustration, here is an example of an advertisement from Whip and Spur magazine, which was a magazine intended for a country, the country club folk. Um, and this sells the idea of individually tailored suits as being the mark of a gentleman. And it applies if you have a custom tailored suit, uh, other people of wealth and means will recognize you as somebody who is worth getting to know. Also, this is an ad for Vanderborg's department store, which talks about Vanderborg's princess shop and implies that if you shop at our princess shop, you'll be shopping with other debutantes, which was attractive to um, some young, young women. Uh, Jaffer's Jewelers used to be a jewelry store in downtown St. Louis. And as part of their business, they sold engraved uh, watches and rings, and they also engraved stationery. Uh, so as part of this, they ended up publishing an etiquette guide for uh, correspondence, which may not seem like an obvious thing for a jewelry store to do, but by doing this, they were able to uh, promote and sell their own stationery by encouraging people to use engraved stationery in, as everyday items um, for simple things like invitations to dinner parties, where today you might only see fancy engraved stationery for things like wedding invitations. And um, here's an advertisement um, that's trying to sell an item as being a high-class thing to have. Does anyone have a guess as to what's being sold here? Well, this is actually an advertisement for Spanish olives, which you can see them right there. It's not necessarily something you would think of as a high-class item, but it's trying to sell them as something if you want a fancy dinner party, you have to have olives on your table. So there was a whole set of rules around paying calls and visits. In the 19th century, it was mostly a leisure class who had time to do this uh, when more working class people had to work during the day. Um, and there was a whole set of guidelines around things such as who should answer the door, uh, what do you do with your hat, uh, when do you take someone's hand, and when it's appropriate to leave. Uh, this advice, I think, is interesting. It says a formal call should not exceed a quarter of an hour which to me seems like hardly enough time to sit down and even talk to somebody, but apparently that was the norm back then. Uh, a hostess, host or hostess would generally pick a day of the week when they would be called at home to receive callers, and members of their social circle would come around and pay a brief visit and then be on their way to the next household. And if a person was not at home, they could leave the calling card to indicate that they had stopped by. Uh, this is an example of a calling card from William Clark of Lewis and Clark fame. Uh, he, he lived in St. Louis after the voyage of discovery and he paid his calls just like anybody else. So from one of the etiquette guides we have in our library, um, there is a do's and don'ts section about paying social calls with some neat illustrations. This is an example of good behavior. On the other hand, this is particularly bad behavior for paying calls. <laughs> Does anyone want to guess what's going horribly wrong in this picture? <laughs> well, uh, let's go through them once for, one for one. Uh, number one, she has her hands on her hips and she looks kind of annoyed or angry. Uh, number two, she has her legs crossed, uh, her elbow on her knee. Number three, has his hat on indoors, which is a big no-no. Sitting backwards in his chair. Uh, number four is leaning against the wall. He's eating in front of other people when no one else is. Um, and it looks like his coat and pants are either dirty or torn. It's kind of hard to tell. Uh, number five has his foot on a chair, and he's wearing kind of a flashier suit than the people around him. Um, and I think number six takes the prize for the worst for the <laughs> He is leaning back in his chair against the wall. He has his hat on his knee. He's smoking in front of the ladies, and there's also a spittoon on the floor next to him, implying he might be spitting in front of the ladies, too. So that's a big note. I guess, and his hand is in his pocket. Uh, table manners have their own set of rules. Um, this is from an etiquette book on table manners, and some things are somewhat familiar from what we do today. It advises when you're eating to hold your fork in your right hand, which today it might be a more dominant hand, but it's still not too strange for us. And also they suggest when you're eating and drinking to make as little noise as possible. 
um, which I think most people would agree today that's still something we do, but this is actually a very cultural thing. If you have dinner at someone's house in China and you're not making a lot of noise, they're going to assume you're not enjoying your meal because it's an sign of appreciation. That's coming up. <laughs> uh, some things mentioned though in this guide from the 1850s are a little more unfamiliar. Uh, such as this, what, that mentions that knives are made for cutting, not for eating. And if you eat with your knife, you're going to cut your lips. That may seem kind of obvious to us today. Um, but actually, it also goes on to mention that in old-fashioned houses, it's okay to still eat with your knife um, if there are only two pronged forks. So uh, this implies that in the recent past, when this book was written, pe people regularly would eat with their knives, which is something almost, I think, inconceivable today. Uh, here's an example of what an older table setting used to look like. Um, that's the two-pronged fork that it mentioned in the etiquette guide. This is actually a setting from the Shrine of St. Ferdinand in Florissant, Missouri. Um, there used to be a girls' school there in the 1820s, and this was the um, very simple table setup that they, they used back then. And contrast that to this etiquette guide from the 1870s. Um, this was written by Mary Foote Henderson, who was the wife of a Missouri senator, and she wrote this um, popular guide on how to conduct dinner parties. And this is her more, much more elaborate suggestion. And you can see just in 70 years how much things have changed. Uh, suddenly you have multiple forks and knives, um, different forms of glassware, and everything is a lot more uh, formalized than it was uh, previously in the 1820s example. Um, the silverware and uh, dishes that people use have also gotten more, were, were more elaborate in the past than they are today. Um, here's an example of a tea set from probably around 1910-ish. Um, you can see this, the teapots are silver, um, they have delicate china, which not a lot of people will have anymore today. Um, I know I have a plain tea kettle and maybe 10 different mugs of all different shapes and sizes and colors. Um, so certainly nothing as formal as what we see here. And I like the little girl's expression in the middle. Uh, perhaps she's receiving a lesson on how to conduct a tea party. She looks very serious, and like she's uh, studying very hard. And then suddenly you jump forward to the late 1960s, and there's no silverware or, or plates anywhere to be found. Uh, people are eating with their hands, and the whole atmosphere is a lot more casual than what you had um, 60, 70 years earlier. And I think uh, these people would be absolutely appalled to see people eating that way. <laughs> but suddenly in the late 60s, it's normal, and uh, it would be normal for us today as well. So there was a whole set of etiquette around of walking on the street as well. Um, this advice book suggests that when men and women walk together on the street, that the man takes the curb side of the street. And think about why that would be. Um, well, streets at the time were a lot different than they are today. There were horses and carriages, and there was always a danger that the horse would run out of control and get up onto the sidewalk. So walking this way was uh, kind of an old, older Chippewa's notion of protecting the lady from potential dangers on the street. Also, um, think about what horses left behind on the street. The streets were a lot dirtier back then. There was mud and muck and manure and who knows what else. So walking this way would allow um, women to protect their long skirts from getting dirty, because the sidewalks were generally a lot more cleaner than uh, the streets. And um, now a little bit about hats. Um, at one time, this was a common accessory that uh, people would no long, would not leave the house without wearing their hats any more than they would leave the house without their trousers. Um, but today, if you walk on the street, you may see a couple baseball caps here and there, but really not uh, hats like people used to wear. And here's an example of a famous hat wearer. Um, you would never see this type of hat out in the street anymore unless somebody specifically dressing up like Abe Lincoln for Halloween or something like that. And here's another example of uh, the French Creole style. This is a young boy in St. Louis about 1820. Uh, and for well, these hats would have been made out of beaver uh, pelts, and fur was one of St. Louis's earliest industries. Uh, so they, St. Louis played an important part in hats at the time. So there was also a whole set of rules of what do you do with your hat when you're walking on the street. Um, to signal social equals, um, you were expected to tip your hat at them. 
And if you saw somebody you knew on the street who did not tip their hat at you, that was seen as a serious social snub, and it was called a cut. Uh, and there was a whole set of rules, such as uh, when you're with a lady who bows, bows to somebody, you need to tip your hat to that person, even if you don't know them. Um, to always salute ladies or elderly gentlemen, etc. So here is a group um, that's probably the, the Civilian Conservation Corps group at Jefferson Barracks. And you can see just about every single one of them has got a hat. Um, this, so this is from the 1930s. And um, so it doesn't seem all that long ago, but, but hats were very common then. And when a Emily gave this talk earlier, an audience member told a story about her, how her uncle had been in the CCC, and that when he finished the program, he was given a new suit, had to go job hunting in. So we think it's possible that these men are showing off their new hats and suits that they just received. Also, here is a group of uh, women, uh, suffragists, uh, waiting for a train to go to Jefferson City to petition for, for the vote for women. And these women are probably about as radical as women could be in 1916, but not a single one of them would ever dream of leaving the house without her hat. And also here is an illustration from the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis. It's kind of difficult to see the details, but it looks like every single person in the background is also wearing a hat. Uh, so this really started to change in, in the mid-20th century, and part of the reason might have been um, taken after the fashion of JFK, who famously was not a hat wearer. Um, so it wasn't too long after that that people stopped wearing their hats as frequently as they had in the past. The gloves are another accessory that people really only wear for function now rather than fashion. Um, people used to wear them, especially women, for everyday use, but today you really only wear them if it's cold outside, you need to protect your hands, or if you're gardening or something like that. Of course, there are rules for how you wear your gloves. Uh, this, uh, this advice suggests that people leave their gloves on when they're, they're shaking hands if it's hot outside so you don't subject somebody else to your sweaty hand. And here's just an example of what uh, short, fashionable gloves would look like in the big 19th century. And uh, sometimes people wanted to balance uh, the fashion with gloves with jewelry. So this woman found the solution by wearing fingerless gloves that allowed her to show off her rings as well as her gloves. So uh, dancing also is closely bound together with etiquette. Um, in the 19th century, dancing was one of the few ways that men and women could get together and um, have close contact that was socially acceptable before marriage. Um, this advertisement for the Mahler Dancing Academy makes it clear that dancing and etiquette are part of the same process. Although there are always some people who think that dancing leads to bad behavior. <laughs> As this pamphlet called From the Ballroom to Hell makes clear. <laughs> but in general, dancing was socially acceptable, um, although it was, it was a lot different back in the 19th century from what we do today. Uh, the steps were more formalized. Um, and has anyone heard the, the phrase, put me on your dance card? These used to be actual dance cards that would list the order of dances for the evening. Um, and there would be a space for people to write in their partners. But can anyone guess why this man wrote down things like Miss Bouquet and Miss Robe Rouge? Well, we think uh, probably he didn't know the names of his partners, so he just wrote down something descriptive so he could find them later when the time came. <laughs> like the lady in the red dress. <laughs> and the final uh, dance of the evening was always a waltz. And this man danced with Miss Woodlock, which he apparently thought was splendid. Which is very nice. <laughs> and now jumping ahead in time to our more modern ideas of dancing, uh, suddenly it's a lot less Formal um, partners are optional, as evidenced by the lady dancing with alone with her co coffee cup, and she looks like she's having a great time doing so. Uh, there are no formal steps to learn. Uh, it's just a lot more casual than you have in the past. So debutantes um, are a very old-fashioned idea, but it's still re pretty relevant in St. Louis, mostly because of the VP ball. Uh, which was started in 1878, and it was modeled on uh, similar events in New Orleans at the time. Uh, so every year, a uh, veiled prophet is chosen, and his identity is kept a secret. 
and a court of young women are presented to him at, at a ball, and uh, he will choose from them the queen of love and beauty. And it's been criticized over the years for being uh, too exclusive and um, excluding certain categories of people over the years. And partly as a response to that, different communities started creating their own events, uh, such as the Catholic community started the Fleur de Lis Ball, in which um, young, uh, well-to-do Catholic women would be presented to the Archbishop in St. Louis. And uh, these images are almost identical to scenes that you'll see in, in England of um, debutantes being presented to the Queen in their coming out seasons. Also, the African-American community responded with a Cotillion de Leon, which used to take place at the Chase Park Plaza. And with all these three events, uh, you still have the question of who's in, who's out, who, um, who is excluded and not invited from each of these events, because there's still only the, the, um, the highest of society for each different group who get to go. Uh, so dueling, fortunately, is a topic that has changed quite a lot and that we don't have it anymore. It used to be very common in Missouri. We actually had a senator named Thomas Hart Benton, who was a senator for over 30 years, and early in his career, he actually killed a man in St. Louis uh, named Charles Lucas. But this did not stop him from continuing to serve as senator. And can you imagine today the attack ads if somebody killed somebody and then tried to run for Senate? That would not go over well. And even though dueling was not, was not legal, it was very common. So people started dueling in St. Louis on this place called Bloody Island in the Mississippi River. It was kind of a no man's land between Missouri and Illinois, so it was kind of a place where they could escape the law and get away with it. Um, and dueling at the time was kind of a public spectacle. Uh, people would actually gather on both sides of the riverbank to try to see and hear what was going on. And the reasons for dueling usually had to do with public rep reputation and honor. So you had a lot of politicians and uh, lawyers and newspaper men uh, who would duel. And over the years, different laws were passed to try to stop dueling, but nothing really worked until the 1850s, when um, finally a law was passed that stated if you participate in a duel in any way, uh, so if you're the, the principal people dueling, if you're the seconds, if you're the people who pass messages back and forth, etc. Um, if you do that, you're not eligible anymore for public office. And that's when dueling finally died out, because it turned out people cared more about their careers than their, than their honor after all. <laughs> uh, so warning customs is another thing that's changed quite a bit over the years. Um, here is an example of an elaborate embroidery that a young woman stitched for her father, who died in 1819. And she actually ended up receiving a medal for this piece. Um, some of the rules around mourning were rigid. People were expected to wear black, um, such as black woolen materials, um, very plain and formal. And they said it was incorrect to wear bright jet trimmings. So it's not in the proper spirit of mourning if you wear shiny black material or beads. Um, you have to be very somber. But in uh, this guide in 1888, they're also acknowledging that some of the rules are changing. Uh, they say it's not appropriate to wear mourning dress of an ostentatiously uh, somber character if you're not actually really all that sad about what happened. <laughs> if you're not really in deep sorrow. And they also acknowledge that people today, I mean in 1888, they don't wear mourning dress as long as they used to in the past. Uh, so they're already acknowledging that times are changing. And I think that's true today. You don't really see people going into periods of mourning in the same way where they wear black for uh, weeks and months on end. They make for a funeral and a few, few days around that, but that's pretty much it. Uh, so now I'm gonna end on a little bit about health and hygiene. Remember the spittoon from earlier? Uh, this is also called a cuspidor. And it may seem kind of gross spittoons to us today, but it was actually a big step forward uh, because in Frontier, Missouri, people just would spit wherever they felt like it. So uh, it could be a danger in public places like railroad stations and even like City Hall and the state legislature because people would just sit and you gotta, or spit and you had to watch where you sat and walked. So it was a good thing when spittoons were invented and people started using them. Um, in the Missouri State Legislature, there was actually a position called the spittoon keeper where it was this poor man's job to go around and empty all the spittoons from the different members of the legislature. 
Every single man had a spittoon under his, uh, his desk. And a kind of a unique culture uh, sprung up in the legislature around these spittoons. Um, if a speaker was speaking and they were boring or somebody disagreed with what they were saying, the men would rattle their spittoons underneath the desk to signal their disapproval. Uh, so one man tried to do this on Champ Clark. And he stopped speaking, he looked, at, looked in that direction, and he said, the next man that interrupts me that way will have a spittoon fired at his head. Oh. <laughs> and it worked, nobody ever did it to him again. <laughs> uh, so spittoons started to go out of fashion when, um, in the early 20th century, when people began to better understand how germs and disease spread. Um, especially after the influenza ep epidemic of the 19-teens. And in the 1920s, uh, chewing gum was invented, which started to replace tobacco, uh, chewing tobacco, which was the most frequent cause of, of spitting. And another thing that's changed over time is handkerchiefs. Um, this used to be a, a common item that everyone would carry around, and it's much less common today. Um, at one time, no polite person would be caught dead if without their handkerchief. And in 1911, um, the sixth department store actually had 10 whole pages of handkerchiefs that you could order, which is kind of incredible. And these started to go out of fashion with the invention of Kleenex. Um, which was originally marketed as a, a way to remove makeup, but they quickly realized that it can be a hygienic substitute for a handkerchief as well, and started advertising themselves as such. And then smoking. Um, at one time, smoking was not done in, male, in mixed company. It was something primarily male people did. And here's an example of a board of directors um, meeting after dinner. Many of them have cigars in their hands and there's not a single woman anywhere to be seen. Uh, here's another image uh, showing a group of working class Germans smoking around a, a stove, and also it's all male. And remember our very bad behavior as man smoking in front of the women? Could not do that. And the, there were rules around smoking, saying that if you were go going to smoke and then go out into public, it was polite to change your clothes so you wouldn't inflict the smell of your smoke on people in places like a crowded theater or on the street. And um, women started to smoke more with the invention of the cigarette, which was specifically marketed towards women. And it, I think now cigarettes have kind of taken over cigars for men as well. Um, here is an image from a pajama party in the 1920s where many of the girls are smoking. And even the young girl in the corner there, um, she's not actually holding anything, she's pretending to smoke to fit in with the, the older girls. And here is an image of cynical society ladies um, in 1920 showing just how common smoking had become for women as well. Um, so here they are looking very bored and, um, <laughs> and fashionable, saying, God bless our home for three years. So they're probably not intending to be married for very long. <laughs> so that is all I have today. Um, so does anybody have any questions? Or I also want to open it up to anyone if they have any stories about uh, breaches of etiquette that they've experienced over the years or want to talk about how things have changed. Um, I'm open to anything. Yes. Back when uh, the gloves were popular, they were starting to go out. And the my friend invited me to go visit some relatives of hers in Indianapolis, and she said, and don't forget your gloves because we're going downtown shopping. I thought, well, that was really weird for her to say, but I found out what the problem was. We wore gloves because there was nothing but cold soap down there. Yeah. And if um, you had your hands free, they were black. Right. So you let your gloves be black. Then when you went in the restaurant to eat, you took the gloves off, so you had clean hands. Ah, uh, that makes sense. <laughs> yes. I remember as a boy that all women, at least in Catholic churches, would have to wear a hat. And if they forgot their hat, they pull out a handkerchief. Oh, really? That's <laughs> 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 That, uh, that fellow that was uh, leaning his chair back, I would like to see him try that at mom's house. He <laughs> 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 will be a person last <laughs> He never had a good lesson, apparently. <laughs> so you're talking about manners and that. Uh, mom was very strict at home, and anybody mm -hmm. that came in the 
house. Uh, she didn't allow smoking in the house or any cussing whatsoever. <laughs> and, uh, she didn't tell him right off the bat, you know, she said, hey, you're going to talk like that? Out. You know, never, never bat an eye. You know, you had to do the things that, in her presence, that she wanted uh, done. Period. Right. Wow. <laughs> she had her Good for her, yeah. Also, but uh, what about wearing hats in the house? My grandma would swap me in the head with if I come walking in with a hat on. Oh, really?
had to, uh, uh, all males had to give up their seat for a female. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's interesting. You don't really see that very often anymore. I think at present day Walmart ought to install some big mirrors right by the front door so they can see what they look like. <laughs> Well, let's give Jamie a big hand, shall we?